This is the Rethinking Impact Capital in Africa, Private Credit as an Asset Class. And I'm joined by our esteemed colleagues here, the stars of the show. We have Aubrey Ruby, who is co-founder of Tofino Capital and Insider PR. We have Abele Okeke, who is managing partner of Altica Partners in Africa. And we have Saad Sheikh, partner at Enco Capital. And so thank you all for being here today. Um, and I know from your esteemed careers that you have actually been preparing your whole lives for this moment. Um, all right, so um, let's dive in so that we can hear as much from our panelists as we can today. But um, the truth is with a small group like this, we'd love for it to be more interactive. We can actually do that with this size group. So um, please feel free to, if you want to raise your hand, um, please please feel free. We're not gonna do the note cards for questions or anything. We want, we want this to be interactive. Um, these panelists are here for you. Uh, but just to start, I wanted to know, we're here to talk about private credit as an asset class. Um, and Saad shared some data with me uh, in, in preparation for this. And he really shared that Africa needs around 130 to $170 billion annually to bridge its infrastructure gap and generate sustainable growth of 5% per year or more. And this really creates an immense opportunity for private investors. And yet there, the contributions of private investors remains notoriously low. And so this is where adequately priced private capital can demonstrate real results. Uh, and I think we can agree that the growth burden can't be on African governments alone, that the private sector has to play a meaningful role. Um, and so, in terms of impact, I know our panelists will say, um, as we prepared, our panelists will say that Africa is arguably the best region to showcase, implement, and measure impact. Um, specifically, once you inject impact capital into a company, there's multiplier effects um, that really brings numerous additional benefits to the community in addition to just the jobs that it creates. And so I want to start um, with asking each of you, really, um, if you could share some case studies where private credit investments have made a significant impact on communities and businesses in Africa, and what lessons can we draw from these experiences? Sure. Um, I'll start. Um, thanks a lot. Um, I'm Saad, as, um, uh, as Alison mentioned, and I've been running private credit or an uh, aspect of private credit in Africa for the last 10 years. Um, the learning outcome that I've seen is Africa is a nascent economy as, as general uh, continent-wide uh, asset. Um, the challenges that Africa has is more predominant to what frontier markets have, and they're kind of edging towards the uh, uh, emerging markets as well. However, uh, what we do realize is Africa's always seen as a little bit of a stepchild uh, for a bizarre reason that I can't give you the answer to being in this industry for 10 years. Now, some of the examples that I, sh uh, that I can share that we've invested in, um, let, me, let me go into healthcare. We were talking, Alison and I were talking about it a few minutes ago. We invested in an AIDS and malaria drugs manufacturing business in Uganda. The number of deaths from AIDS and malaria back in 2009 were over 2 million a year. And this is a curable disease. We are in you know, past the noughties, and these are very curable diseases. Uh, but Uganda and the East Africa region was really struggling. The Sipla Quality Chemicals uh, plant that uh, we were one of the first investors uh, going in um, turned that, that situation around the debts dropped by 95% in the local kind of uh, jurisdiction. Uh, that manufacturing became an epitome of world-class manufacturing capabilities on the continent. Yes, it got technical support and manufacturing capabilities from India, but we do believe in tech transfer. Yes, Africa needs tech transfer, but it has phenomenal talent. So one of the things that we were able to achieve was reduce debts. The other thing that we were able to create was uh, improved talent and capabilities across the continent. Lastly, when, uh, in 2018, we listed it in the local stock exchange. 
So glo the, the global investors that previously had no idea about um, Africa, and uh, as, a, as an example, JP Morgan actually was taking a look at it. Um, they'd never looked at Uganda before. So that really opened the doors to an opportunity in Uganda. So that's kind of one of the examples that I can share. But another one that I can go into, uh, again, staying on the healthcare theme, theme is Liberia Mother and Child Care Clinic. Uh, this is private and government support, uh, so PPP project, uh, very mid-scale, nothing too elaborate, but we were the first uh, mother and child care clinic in Liberia, in Monrovia, uh, to support uh, natal, postnatal, and even mental health post-delivery. Um, and the amount of uh, trauma that we saw through that was immense. We then uh, partnered with the uh, American Heart Foundation, and they would send, send surgeons for two weeks a year, and they would perform complex surgeries within our clinic. That immense amount of impact is very hard to create, um, but this is very low-hanging fruit in Africa. Because of the lack of infrastructure development, there are very simple problems that you can solve through adequately priced and, and structured capital. Sometimes we've seen capital go into Africa that is misaligned. Investors lose out, entrepreneurs lose out. And that's what we as, as kind of uh, practitioners on the African continent feel needs to be corrected. So Asen, I hope that- No, that's fantastic. No, thank you. And other, I know that when we were talking in advance of this session, we really wanted to get across the case studies and the feeling of when you invest private credit in Africa, that you're not just helping the company, you're helping the community. Um, so I'd love to hear from, from you two if other examples. Go ahead, Abel. Yeah, so I think the first thing, I want, to, uh, the first thing I, I want to say is this asset class is made for impact. Uh, and what I mean is when you look at other asset classes, so you look at private equity where you have an investor injecting equity, actually buying a stake in the African company, and then turning around the business, sitting on it for a few years, and then selling and exiting. In order to generate the return for the investor, they have to exit. And exits in Africa are not very easy. So you have a situation where um, an exit may end up going to a larger multinational. So there's actually a wealth transfer out of Africa to a larger multinational. When we look at the companies we look at in Africa, we are looking at supporting local businesses and basically trying to create African-owned and African-run champions. So we would go to them and say, hey, look, you, know, we, you need to grow. The African banks don't understand your business or you're just a bit too small for them, for many of the banks. And you're giving them capital, you're helping them with their business, you're giving lots of technical assistance, you're helping them with the banks, with, the, with, with trade, with marketing, a little bit similar to what you see in the PE space. But at the end of the day, they understand that they're using your capital to grow and in return, they need to give you back um, your capital plus a return and in some cases, you could get an equity kick or a warrant and so on. And that way, um, you can clearly see and you're actually generating, and that company may end up you know, exporting and growing bigger and bigger and actually becoming a multi-country champion. And, and, that, and the impact and the wealth is still within the community and in, in, in country. In terms of examples, I mean, it's so, there's so many examples that come to mind. If you look at, we're looking at a, a mango um, producer in Ghana who's been producing mangoes, you know, second generation producing mangoes for 15, 20 years and exporting it to, to Europe, to Germany and, and to Austria. And, you know, they came to us looking for a $7 million loan. And they actually, first of all, they went to African banks and African banks, well, you make you, you mangoes grow on trees here all the time. What you do is just sell mangoes. What are you coming to us? We're not interested um, unless you can give us a lot of collateral um, on on your farm, on your house, on your relatives' properties as well. So African banks tend to kind of over over collateralize um, on, on transactions. In this situation, all they wanted to do was to export, was to create a, a processing plant where they could actually. Um, create the, um, so export the juice and the pulp as opposed to just exporting mangoes. 
So in the European Union, there are very sort of strict rules as to how fruit can look. And if the, if the fruit has a different shape or it has lots of spots on it, it won't be sold in the top, in the top tier supermarkets. So this is a situation where coming in with capital, uh, with private credit, helping them to create this facility, um, creates more jobs, brings in additional value, local value add, and it allows them to, to gain a, a higher price for their product as opposed to just selling mangoes. Anybody can export mangoes. But actually being able to create this, you know, puree or um, concentrate and being able to export is transformational for these communities. So you see a situation where not only are you providing jobs in the community, in the facility, but you're, I mean, the, uh, I remember the woman who actually, who actually um, runs the canteen, the staff canteen, suddenly has more work to do and can employ more people and her kids don't have to help her on the business anymore, her kids can now go to school. So it's just endless, endless multiply effect. And you can see that very clearly. For every single dollar you put in, you can clearly calculate and measure what the impact is. So let me just say a little bit about my background and how I see um, what we do uh, as impact. Um, so I've been uh, active in African markets for over 20 years. Now, when I started, if you think about a Venn diagram, all investing in Africa was impact investing, okay? Now, as the world of impact investing has changed over the years, those, those diagrams have kind of pulled apart to some extent, whereas some people view impact as about process, and others are about just the outcomes in a way. Um, so I uh, now, these days, I spend a lot of my time uh, not actually on the debt side, on the equity side. I'm with a venture fund. We have a small venture fund seed stage focused on frontier markets uh, with a simple premise that we invest in markets where venture capital per capita is less than $10. Okay. So th the impact is huge because there's, it's, a, it's a capital poor environment. Um, that doesn't mean people don't have cash under their mattresses. That doesn't mean that there's not richness in other ways, but from a formal capital investing perspective. And just as a comparison, for example, um, so venture capital per capita in Nigeria is less than $10. It's about six, six and a half. Um, you know, venture capital per capita in India is over 35. Okay. In the United States, it's 1,000. Right. So, so even some of the more advanced ecosystems have, have um, grown um, and, and have more penetration. Now, why do, I, why do I care about this? And why does debt come in at the level that I even work in? Okay, one million Africans turn 18 every month. This is the problem for our generation, next generation, in addition to climate change. Those are the two major problems. There's fundamentally not an opportunity frontier for them. So where are those jobs going to create, be created? Now, the whole region is a, creates 1 million a year, which means an 11 million deficit. So I back the entrepreneurs that are going to change, the change makers that are creating the jobs tomorrow. Now, what do they need in addition to equity? Any company, healthy balance sheet, needs equity and debt. The average interest rate across African markets is 18.5 to 23%, depending on the market, if you want to borrow. It is prohibitive to grow a company with that in many ways. So some of the entrepreneurs that I deal with at the very early stage, uh, even into series A and B, are using equity for debt purposes, for working capital, basically, because they don't have working capital facilities. So um, one of the things I've helped to do is to figure out ways and structure, and Saad and I have talked about this in local currency uh, uh, structures um, at his last job in Nigeria, for example, Naira denominated local currency so that um, founders and, and companies in their growth stage can access affordable debt, which is what's going to allow them to scale. Um, so the real message here is that I think we're all motivated by impact. Um, we chose... I choose to do what I do um, in a very straightforward, traditional, structured, LPGP structure, <laughs> you know, none of these other things. But um, in this space, you know, I, I think we all have to come together to think how to expand the access to capital. And, you know, if you're worried about risk, debt, debt makes the most sense. You're senior. I'm more willing to take risk. I'm an early stage investor in 
frontier markets. But for those who are on the sidelines and need to think about um, mitigating downside a little bit, then debt's a no-brainer. And I also, like Saad, fundamentally do not understand what has retarded the growth of the uh, private cat credit market or an asset, an asset class in Africa over those years. You can do dollar denominated senior lending. It, it makes zero sense um, and except for some kind of sustained racial bias and misunderstanding of, of risk. So let me stop there and we can jump in with other questions or audience things as well. Yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning, we'd love for this to be interactive. If you have questions, please let us know. Um, so we've talked a lot about... Oh, did somebody raise their hand? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Crystal. I have two unrelated questions. So yeah. That's a hog on the question time. Um, I'm curious, um, you talked about uh, equity, mm -hmm. and um, the conventional thinking is that there's so much money in private credit relative to equity because of the exit challenge. Um, I'm curious to hear your thought on the exit challenge. Uh, and then also, if you're seeing innovative alternatives to... Um, assessing uh, credit risk other than collateralizing or kind of conventional credit ratings? So I can speak to, to this. I mean, if you look at private debt as an asset com class compared to uh, private equity in African markets, no, it's not dwarfed. It's, it's not what it should be from normal ratios in normal markets. Um, there's, I don't know, correct me, guys. I mean, there's probably... Um, nearly 25, 30 African private equity funds, um, and then the big, let's say, 12 manage over a billion and a half to three billion, the DPIs, the ECPs, the, these guys. Um, the number of debt funds for Africa, what are they, with three, three, four now? You know, Bluebeak, Vantage, I mean, so it, it's highly underdeveloped. Um, in the venture debt space, there's no one. I don't, actually don't think the economics work very well, and I'm not arguing for venture debt. I'm arguing for working capital funds, which are different things. Um, and uh, there are some innovative blended finance structures that I've seen um, to deal with working capital funds where um, someone in the kind of public sector DFI or aid agency can put a first loss guarantee in actually convince the bank to, to lend to someone uh, to create a working capital facility for a company that, again, in my space may not be three years old yet. It may not have the track record yet. Um, when you're talking about individual credit in the market, um, that's, I think, where more alternative credit scoring uh, has been pioneered with through fintech players, um, less so on the company side. And I mean, I'll just say it, I mean, African banks are some of the most profitable in the world. And I sometimes bemoan the fact that in English we only have kind of one word for bank because it makes people from the outside think that they're doing something different than they are. Especially if you grew up in a market like the US where retail banking is at core, like I'm from Denver, right? Many entrepreneurs, their first loan is from First Bank Colorado that's only in Colorado. It's a retail bank at its core, servicing small business. Most African banks at their core buy government paper and they lend to 12 corporates. And that's why they make a lot of money and retail banking's expensive. And so, yeah, you're, you're dealing with a dearth of credit in the market, but I will. Yeah, I, I, completely, I completely kind of uh, want to build on what uh, Aubrey said, because the premise, I think, and if we've gotten that right, uh, fair enough, but if we've not, please correct us. The premise that there's more debt in the market than equity, um, I don't think stands to the effect that um, you know, for, for example, in the U.S., you've got 125% uh, debt to GDP. In most African markets, you've got less than 10%. Right? Now, when you, when you look at debt uh, from SME systems, there's negligible for, for exactly the reasons that Aubrey's mentioned. Banks have no appetite to lend. They are on an IFRS uh, nine system where they have to provision for every dollar they give out to SMEs up to 20% and then kind of there on end it can go up to 100%. So if you're starting to provision any capital you're deploying, you're putting your risk weighted assets into negative territory. The regulator will come and shut you down. 
So as a consequence, what, does, what do banks do is exactly what Aubrey said. 75 to 80% of balance sheets are government paper. The rest of the 20% that is left is going to corporates, the Dan, the Dan Gotes, the, the Nestle's. The Nestle's of this world will come to Africa and say, ooh, I want to borrow from local banks. I don't want to get Capital One in the US to lend to me. I'll, even though they can borrow from Capital One, they'll go to Axis Bank in Nigeria and borrow from there. Now, what is left for the SME market is negligible. Not even 1% of the balance sheet is going into SME space. Now, SMEs employ 70 to 85% of the workforce on the continent, and they have no access to capital. Some of the equity investors that do go in do plant the capital, but then put their agenda on the table. And that is a killer to the business. And I was actually talking to, if you allow me to put an example on the table without naming them, one of the larger hospitals in Nairobi was acquired by 56% by one of the defunct uh, private equity funds out of, out of Dubai. They wanted to cascade down their strategy into the business. That, that business went from $20 million revenue in 2006 to $2.5 million of revenue. Private equity came and killed the model. Now, this is barbarians at the gate all over again without the asset strip. So they didn't strip the assets. They didn't create any value. Neither for them, they went defunct. Um, they didn't create any value for the underlying business. The entrepreneur now comes back, who was kind of let to rot on the side, and he had built the business, but he was bought out and you know sidelined. He comes back and he acquires the, the assets back. Huge discount. It was sold at a $100 million valuation in, I think, 2008, 2009, and now cents on the dollar. But private equity guys who now acquired it, acquired it at zero value. So to, to them, it's of no value. They're not concerned about how many lives that hospital is saving. They're just considered about you know, how many dollars we're going to make out, out of this transaction. As Abele mentioned, the private credit strategy is very closely aligned to the business model. You are counting the dollars the business is making, and you're figuring out where our dollars as investors are going to increase the eventual cash flow of the business. So we're all, for the most part, cash flow investors. We want to build out the business to a level where the cash flows of the business increase, and out of those increased cash flows, we get benefit out of it. And I think that's a fair play of, of the situation. Mm -hmm. But, but the lack of that situation is rampant in Africa. They, as Aubrey mentioned, less than five proper credit fund managers operate in Africa. Banks don't lend in Africa. In a $1.5 billion person market. And then if you look at the size of the, of the economies, I mean, it makes no sense. Zero sense. Yeah. So, so being so undercapitalized on the, on the debt side, we have all experienced um, kind of the hard way, at least I have, that equity is very difficult to make work in Africa. Now, VC is a different play. VC is, you know, there is a secondary market. There are larger players. If you go in seed, you go in pre-Series A. Which is your answer a. to exit for me. Yeah. I'm early in, early out. Someone yeah. else come along. They'll deal with that problem. But, but then that bag of excrements is being passed to somebody else. We're not passing that bag to anyone else. We're saying get the business to a level that you can sustain it. That sustainability is where we're creating the impact. You're creating impact on the cash flows. You're creating impact on the job creation that you've created. Not for five, for five years you've created jobs and then firing 80 to 90% of the workforce when you're exiting. That's not the play here. The play here is that sustainability through job creation that you've enhanced the model, enhanced the business model. That's what, we, that's what we're completely relying on. We're cash flow investors. We're looking at, from an ESG perspective, the environmental social impact, the governance, and how, after us, the governance is going to control this business in a way that it is going to create longevity. In addition to that, we're gender lens investing uh, kind of savvy. So we look at the Gender 2X uh, initiative, and we focus on how to create more efficiencies for women and not a glass ceiling for them. How do we encourage more women at the board level? So we're doing that. In addition to that, we're doing resource efficiency. How much of energy utilization was in the business prior to our investment? And what are we changing by investing in that? So we, do, we follow the TCFD framework, the greenhouse gas emissions, the reduction in all of that, 
and or conversion of conventional power to solar power. So one of the examples I gave earlier of the mother and child care clinic had a diesel generator because power is you know, just not so efficient in Africa. They had a diesel, big diesel generator. We swapped that out for solar, solar, power, uh, solar panels and batteries. That was funded through technical assistance. So that's where philanthropic capital can come in. But you also need to create capital that is commercial. You give that return to investors so they come back for more. I think that's what Africa lacks. People think that philanthropic capital is the way to enter into Africa, but lose the, lose the bigger picture. We feel if you return capital to investors, give them a return, they'll come back for more. That's what we do with private credit. And the other thing that I think why this asset class is so important is um, we're now seeing private equity investors coming to us and saying, hey, we've got this, we're five year into our, we're three years into our investment in this African company. They can't get credit to grow. They need leverage. Oh, that's the and they're going to the African banks and the African banks are like, well, where's your land? Where's your collateral? Like, you know, well, we don't understand your business. I mean, for example, if you're, if you're in the fintech space, your digital lender, African banks are not really interested in lending to you because you're disrupting their market, right? So you've got these, and some of these uh, uh, private equity investors and North American investors, and we have people in Silicon Valley who've invested in these, you know, startups and VC uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and new businesses, which African banks just don't understand. They're not traditional, typical, you know, natural resource type of businesses. So you've got a situation where the private equity firm is nervous that no one is going to buy this business from them at the end of their fund life unless their companies get credit. We've also got an odd situation, which is very different to what you see in, um, in, in Europe or North America, where we have African banks calling us up and say, hey, we've got this really good company, right? It's really good. They, they're never going to default. We can give you all their track record and their history. You can see everything. We don't want to give them money. We just want to keep, we, we want to manage the salary accounts. We want to give all their employees credit cards. We want to do the FX. We want to do all the trade finance. But can you give them a loan? And then we go, well, why don't you give them a loan? Like, ah, we can't, we're, we don't have enough dollars or we're trying to raise capital. Like, you know, we're, we're servicing the bigger guys who can pay us in multiple income areas. You know, I'd much rather lend to, to and so I'd say like a Nestle or someone like that who's going to pay me in 10 different areas of my bank than lend to a guy who's making cookies like, you know, for, for children's parties. Like, you know, that's not my interest. So there's such a big gap in the market. It's a great asset class for if you're sort of dipping your toes into Africa for the first time. Um, and then I think someone asked something about credit ratings. So the interesting thing is when you're assessing, if you're sitting in a in a developed institution and you're looking at developed markets and you're assessing credit risk of any particular country or any, any particular company in, so if you're assessing credit risk of a German, you know, shoe, electronics company, you would look at the credit rating of Germany, then you, you look at, and then you price as a, on a, a premium on top of the, the sovereign, you look at the sovereign and you price on top. In Africa, you can't really do that because there are many corporates that borrow better and cheaper and they better run than the sovereigns. So if you think, hey, look, I mean, I remember when Zambia was going through a tough time on, on the credit markets um, because they had so much debt at the sovereign level from China. Nobody wanted to invest in Zambian companies. But we saw some of the great companies that were, we saw this company that was exporting blueberries They've been exporting blueberries to France and the UK, to the biggest supermarket chains for the last 12, 14 years. And they were getting paid um, on time in London, in pound sterling, and banks didn't want to lend to them because they're in Zambia. I would, I'd much rather lend to them than the Zambian government any day, right? So the, the, there needs to be there's a reverse view on credit, I mean, on looking at credit, uh, which is kind of a little bit difficult to explain to people who do you know, if you speak to someone that does like, you know, asset-backed lending or CDLs or CDS over here, it's like a complete different way of thinking about, about things. 
Yeah, one important distinction I, I want to bring in is, again, I just talked about the different the use of the word bank and what you understand as a bank, um, but also private equity. Private equity in Africa is not an LBO situation. They're not coming in and levering up companies. They're growth equity, and these are our friends. And, and it, when done well, that's, that's right, but you're, you're there to grow a company, and you can't grow a company purely in a sustainable fashion with just equity. And so, again, part of their goal, if it's done right, there's a right marriage there. They're there to access debt uh, as well so the company can grow. Most of the companies are highly under leveraged um, uh, that they, what they could be. So it, it's, it's a different case of what, you know, the private equity LBO Raiders kind of story of the United States um, and, uh, and other markets. So just wanted to kind of shape that idea um, out there, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, just a follow-up question. I know there's a lot of programs focused on entrepreneur formation. Uh, are you guys aware of any promising initiatives to do like uh, investor education and to hold, like create systems that would create the type of financial institutions that would better serve com com uh, companies? What do you mean by investor education? What kind of investors? Like, or even financial institutions that better, would better serve the needs of I'm not sure. I mean, the issue is this. Straight up, I've been doing this for 20 years, 20 plus years. I spend all my time trying to educate other investors. I put my own money. And look, there are 2,500 people at SOCAP, and this is how many people we can get. So it's, it's, I'm not sure. Um, there's all kinds of US government. I've seen six different programs. This is this Educate Investors, that, Roadshell. Listen, as soon as you start saying, invest in African markets, only certain people walk through the door. So many of you in this room are already invested. I already know you. Like, it's preaching to the choir all the damn time. So it's, it's very hard. There's been some experiments, and I think they need to be more, that remove the geography from the marketing. So for example, like before OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation became the USDFC. By the way, I live in Washington, so I'm gonna, could speak to some of the US government agencies. Um, they did an effort on a road show where they um, did one time, you know, they'd done, you know, look at these Africa energy deals or whatever. Then the year after, they're like, let's just do this experiment and let's just do a renewable energy road show, right? And all the deals we're going to show are in Africa, but we're not going to say that until people come to the room. It's a big difference. Yeah. So I think you have to do things like that. The problem is um, the money that can fund that kind of thing and the programmatic uh, players that can fund that kind of thing take now in this administration at USAID, there's something called Prosper Africa that's supposed to actually go mobilize US investment for African markets. Africa's in their name. So they can't like do that kind of experiment in a way. So, um, you know, I think those are, are the challenges and I'm really not sure um, the space that we operate, not me as a venture investor now, but these guys, if you're trying, let me just say it this way, independent of asset class, if you're trying to raise a fund over $50 million, even over $30 million, you are dependent on the DFIs, the development finance institutions. They are kingmakers. They market make, they've done that for private equity in Africa 20 plus years ago, and they still play an outsized role in the importance of the sector. If you're going to raise a, a, a debt fund, a private equity fund at a, at a meaning economic size, you need them. So, you know, in a way, like we're talking about educating the investors, but the universe of DFIs is like 30 of them. So we've been actively trying to educate on, on private debt as an asset class for years, and we don't really know why it's not working, but it's not. So that's, or it's slow to work or, or whatever the case, but um, DFIs we've been pushing. So I don't know if that answers your, your question. I think one of, the miscon or one of the things we talked about in preparation for this panel was that the misconception that investing in Africa is overly risky. Right, a lot more risky than other places. So I'd love to hear um, from you about is investing in Africa really as risky as it seems? I'm guessing not. Um, and why or why not? Because I think that's part of the barrier, right? So, so tell me about that. Well, let me just jump in to say that's why we're talking about debt. <laughs> yeah. It is the easiest risk downside mitigator, period. Like that's why we're talking. 
And then to frame the conversation, I know both of you guys have this, there's real risk, number one of which is currency risk, by far. The Naira to the dollar is what, 1,015 or something like this. Yeah. You know, it, currency risk by far, that's why you're gonna have debt funds or other things that are trying, you're gonna try to hard currency denominate it. Abele just talked about blueberry export in pounds. Currency risk is number one um, real risk. Then there's a whole slate of misperceived and mispriced risk. And that's why we do what we do, because we think yeah. we have a way to capture <laughs> a real value, create value, because we can push away what we see as the mispricing of the risk. Yeah, so I mean, just, just on, on, on that point, I think there's that, yeah, there's that elevated perception of risk. So I think Moody's did a, there's some good data out there, um, from Moody's and, and also AFCA, which is the Africa Venture Capital Association. Um, if you look at default rates, um, specifically in African credits, um, they're actually spe they're, they're extremely low. Um, if you compare them to US, to North America, to Europe, actually, the, the, I think the, the region with the highest default rate was actually Eastern Europe. Um, for some reason, I don't know why. Um, the default rate in North America is actually higher than it's Africa. Three times. It's a Moody's study that is about yeah. energy infrastructure projects, um, yeah. and its default rate is 9% 9, 9 North America, 3% Africa. Yeah. So in North America, you have, the cha you, have the, you have a Chapter 11 process. Many African countries, they haven't gone around to thinking about that. So it's pretty easy to kind of say, hey, look, sorry, I can't pay you back. Um, and in many African countries, just that concept. But first of all, there's so many deals, and just because there's such a, there's, there's so little amount of capital, there's a filtering process, natural filtering process. So most of the good deals, typically the good deals get done. People don't do silly deals, right? Um, there's also a cultural thing as well. In many African countries, just owing money, and maybe it's also I don't know. Maybe it's colonial. Maybe it's like you know, why would we? borrow money from you in, in, in Europe or in the US and we owe you money. In, it's also that. And also there's a lot of extreme structuring, right? There's a lot of structuring. I mean, the minute you say, I'm lending to this African company, I mean, when I talk to LPs here, the first question is, oh, what if it goes to court? Like, how do you handle the lit litigation and all that? Well, we've structured it so well that, you know, we're thinking about the downside from day one, we're not even thinking about the, the upside. We're, we're, we're crossing all the T's and all the dots. We're thinking about every single thing that could go wrong, even a coup happening. What happens if there's a coup? What happens if the new president says, oh, I want this company, it's mine? You know, we've put in all kinds of um, you know, insurance policies and everything else in there. So they're just so well structured that we think about all these different things and the default rate is, is, is extremely low. Um, so yeah, so I think the data is out there. The one part of Africa credit which is extremely risky, um, which the data shows is risky, is when you lend to a state-owned enterprise, right? So if you lend to a if you lend to a company that's owned by a specific government, or you lend to a power company that's owned by the government, the government you know may, can do what they want to do. So when you're looking at private businesses, real businesses that generate jobs. Um, it's not as risky as, as, as it seems. So if, if I could just take that question on perceived risk and give you a couple of examples. Um, the Naira is devalued like crazy. Um, and you've just mentioned it went from, uh, what I've seen from 260 is when I first looked at it, it's over a thousand now, right? But if you compare that to what the Venezuelan currency has done, what the Turkish lira has done, what even the Pakistani rupee has done, right? These are non-African geographies. Yet, the moment an investor goes into Asia, they're not going to say, oh, hang on a minute, we've got Cambodia, we've got Vietnam, we've got Pakistan in these geographies. Oh, I'm not going to invest in Asia. No. They still go into Asia, bearing in mind that their last six defaults on sovereign debt happened in Asia. Three, three sovereign debts happened in, in, um, in Latin America. Only two have happened in the whole of the African continent, and still everybody's freaked out about Africa. So there is this elevated perceived risk of Africa that none of us can give you this, a solid answer why that exists. The perception of that perceived risk is what we're trying to diminish. 
And as Aubrey said, if you want to dip your, and Obele said this as well, if you want to dip your toes, if you want to go into an asset class in Africa that you want to take less risk, then here's a product for you. It's layered and layered and layered with down risk uh, mitigation. Be it a sovereign, be it a guarantee from the US state, be it a guarantee from multilaterals um, in, in, um, um, in Africa themselves, backed by uh, uh, the G7 governments, right? Be it um, a further de-risking mechanisms through mega platforms or other uh, uh, sovereign risk um, uh, de-risking de mechanisms. When you layer all of that, the way that we invest, we'll take that sovereign risk uh, and equate it to the, um, to the underlying business. So let's say it's triple B minus right now in Nigeria, so let's say we take a business with export into the US and we rate it triple B minus. We then put a 50% guarantee from the DFC on it, which is triple A, which is now triple A, right? Uh, they've been downgraded as well. So you, you layer that. Above that, you've got a multilateral guarantee that is A plus, right? So like the Islamic Development Bank or the um, IDB or these types of institutions, they are A rated. They're better than the US government. You take that, and above that, you've, you've got some layer of de-risking uh, de mechanism through local, uh, local collateral. You're not taking 200, 300%, you're taking probably 20, 30, 40, 50% of collateral. So you've got these layers embedded in it. That total de-risking mechanism to your question is then granting that asset a rating of, let's say, collective rating of A minus. So it's significantly superior to the triple B minus rating that Moody's has for Nigeria. As a consequence, you're getting A minus risk that in US, Europe, unlevered is probably going to give you 6%, 5%. Even right now, 6% is the rate that you can get with Fed rates at 5.25. However, with an A minus rating, you're getting 15% gross return in Africa. My question then becomes, what is not to like? Where is the hindrance for investors to get over that line and see that de significant de-risking platforms, significantly improving the rating, still having that great return, guaranteed for the most part, because this is debt, this is self-liquidating, why would you then shy away from that? That's the risk mitigation. That's the... Um, perceived risk versus actualized risk yeah. mm. that we have to bear in mind. Yeah. And the second area is the, uh, uh, is the, uh, the, the risk reward that you're gonna get on this. Those are two areas that I feel investors lack. And to your question, who's educating the investors? Aubrey, I can tell you, stood up with the BII's head of credit and said, why don't you do more of private credit? And that is one institution that has now gone and developed a private credit arm, but that is the only DFI in the entire industry that has a focus on private credit. If the DFIs are the market makers for Africa, you can clearly see the problem that it's creating. Yeah. Lack of private capital is the next stage of the problem. If you want to see Africa as a developing market, which the Biden administration is really pushing for, then you've got to mobilize this private capital, you've got to encourage this private capital. And what we're trying to figure out, and I was having this conversation with Alison, is why aren't they even coming to the table? What is holding people back from a conversation around A minus risk with a 15% return, creating significant impact, where, what are we missing? Yeah, it's just yeah. Unwind, unwinding like a zillion years of narrative and all of that. I, I, I was just in London this past week and there was a, a, a you know exchange like this and a Senegalese, a friend, this is a former minister of budget in Senegal, and then there was an Argentinian on the panel. And he says, can you please teach us how to default? Because like, why on earth? <laughs> like, how can you keep doing this and still getting investment? Still getting like, investors. it's really amazing. That's what he kept being is like, let me like show us, show us how to default like this, man, yeah. to the Argentinian. And it was like a good laugh because, and he can run through. He's like, when I was restructuring in Senegal, we had the same rating as Greece at that time, but he had to borrow at 2 percentage point more when they did a Eurobond. Like, the, it, it, the pricing on this is, is mispriced. Yeah. This yeah. is fundamentally 
mispriced. Right. And, and also look at the African economies are quite simple to understand, right? So most African economies generate their foreign currency from one or two natural resources. If it's Nigeria, it's oil. If the oil price goes down and stays down for a long time, there's a chance the currency is, is likely to devalue. How do you figure out the currency of the, the Vietnamese currency or the Cambodian currency or the, all these other, and most current, other currencies are quite complex, right? So these economies are not opaque. I think people just, we just see people using the wrong lenses to, to analyze the risk and just assuming, I mean, uh, I, I spoke to a, a CEO uh, of, of a large Middle Eastern fund and he said, I really want to do this, but my, my CIO just watches, watches too much CNN. And every time they see, oh, there's a coup in Burkina Faso, he has no idea where Burkina Faso is. He's just like, oh, I'm not doing this Africa thing. Just put, it, put it on ice for now. So that is just what we need to, you know, we need everyone's help in this room to go out there and explain it. And we're sitting in the, in the world's largest, deepest, most sophisticated credit market, right? So some of the things that we are doing in Africa um, and, and a very simple structures, yeah, right? Uh, credit, it's credit 101. So um, we, would, we, we would like to see the North American and European institutions lead uh, in the credit space. Well, Abella, you mentioned that, um, that, that you need everyone's help. So I wanna actually capitalize on that and ask each of you, how can investors and other stakeholders, the people in this room, um, how can they collaborate to accelerate the adoption and impact of investing in Africa? Give them some homework, bring them along. I mean, again, from, from my point of view, um, to just broaden and thinking about different asset classes across the board and that the impact that they have, period, in markets where credit and, and where equity and venture money is still um, scarce. It's still scarce. So, um, and, and therefore, like, whether it's a philanthropy that has a, an arm that can actually make um, LP investments, for example, um, whether it's people's personal capacity, there's all different sizes. I mean, I have a small fund. We take, you know, we take small investments from from private LPs. Um, you know, I think so. There's just a variety of of players, uh, and I think it's it's pushing the dialogue just to be more front and center. That that you know, bringing capital efficient capital markets is transformative in, in, these, in the countries that we focus on. Um, and if you don't have those, uh, then people, you know, economies continue to stay informal, cash stays under the, the, the bed. I mean, all of the things that we see um, and the inefficiencies um, hold back growth. Yeah, I, I'd, re I'd say, you know, I think it's, it comes down to asset allocation as well. Um, be really serious about asset allocation. So we see a lot of investors who have an emerging market bucket, and they've done tick. We've done emerging markets, but actually, how much of Africa is in that emerging markets? And most of the time, people say, "Oh, we have a South African bond." Well, you know, that's not Africa, right? Even if you and even if you have a fixed income strategy, you've invested in multiple African bonds. I would say 99.9% .9 of the top African companies do not have never issued a bond and are very unlikely to ever issue a bond in the next 10 years. So you're missing a whole market. So if you think you've invested in a couple of African bank bonds or a couple of sovereign bonds, you're not even seeing the market. You're not seeing the market at all. So I'm saying be deliberate about, about your emerging market allocation. If you don't want to do an emerging market allocation, do it in the impact allocation. If you don't want to do it there, do it in the ESG allocation. You know, if you don't, there's no need to greenwash in Africa. It's obvious. As soon as you do stuff, you see the impacts. You see, the, you see everything. So I think if you're consultants, people who look and listen to the consultants, if consultants say do emerging markets, think about how much of that emerging market is in Africa. You can do some magic, do all your Argentina, do all your Brazil, do all your Vietnam, but Africa and not just South Africa. It's, it's a great question what we can leave uh, with uh, any allocator sitting in the room, right? So I think one is I, I completely agree with Abele around the allocation piece. 
Um, and what I, but I think the problem is there are no asset allocators in this room. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. That is the problem. Yeah. Oh, we have one. Woohoo! One awesome. One left. One left. So, you know, again, I think that's the big issue. Yeah. And, and you can continue, but, you know, I think we have to think about that. Yeah, exactly. And, and <laughs> while we have one allocator for which we're very kind of grateful, the, the <laughs> idea is this should attract a lot more allocators because, to your point, which is how do we educate investors? Well, have a dialogue with us. It should be around, uh, around kind of platforms that have done well, accomplished returns, why aren't allocators having a real conversation with them? From our side, we've got a hedge fund that does sovereign debt that, by the way, has no impact. It only creates money on money. So if you want to see that and you want to do sovereign, have a conversation, but a real one, right? Most allocators that we've spoken to um, just are like, yes, we want to know more. Send us more information about Africa. Yes, it's very exhilarating, but then no action. It's that call to action that we think is lacking. Then the second thing is, okay, if you've done your hedge fund allocation or if you've done your sovereign debt allocation, which by the way, I think is a bad idea right now, given emerging market sovereign debt is just on a massive decline. Uh, so is, by the way, the bonds in the US. Um, the, the, the question that you ask is, how do, I, how do I then allocate capital and diversify my portfolio or get more access to the, the uh, verticals that Abele mentioned, impact or ESG, through uh, this dialogue with managers who are efficient, who operate in this market? That dialogue will help you understand that there's significant value to be created, and that value, you don't have to work too hard for it. It is really just barely scratching the surface and you're creating that value. So I think if allocators have that real motivation uh, to this Africa strategy, and Africa strategy can't just be sovereign, it has to be deeper than that. Yeah. Um, I think that will go a long way. And what that will then encourage is local players. And by the way, we've been kind of harping on the global industry to come in to Africa the first question that global industry will ask is, what about African capital? There's a lot of African local currency capital sloshing around. What's that doing? There's a, there's a motivation now within pension funds locally to mobilize that capital in pan-African projects. Kenya is doing that. Rwanda's trying to do that. Nigeria started it. Yeah. But if we're able to attract foreign investment from it, it, uh, developed markets, we have a real story to narrate to those local players and say, if we can attract international capital, what's stopping you? So you're helping us galvanize capital, which otherwise is really just blocked. So I think the, 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 uh, the ask here today from the allocators or whoever the thought leaders are here is put that story out there. Do some critical thinking around the asset class. There's a lot of, yes, CNN perceptions or BBC perceptions, Look through that. Yeah. Walk through the journey with us who have real boots on the ground, who've done this, who've, who've lived the, the experiences, right? And we've got war wounds to share, the currency war wounds, how we've gone about and figured out a way to hedge our currency without going to the hedging market. There's swap mechanisms available. Let's have a conversation around that. So I think that, I think there's a lot of a perception that we need to, those barriers we need to, uh, bring down, and we hope that these types of conversations will help. I think and the SoCap encourage. community too can do something, which is to like avoid knee-jerk reactions. So, in the markets that we care about, for example, um, if you care about like, like I'm just bringing up the ESG part and those kind of things. Like me as an American, at some point I'm going to log into my 401k, and it's going to say, "Do you want your 401k invested in fossil fuels?" And you will say no, and not recognize that that has massive issues and, and developmentally um, slowing issues in African markets. Because if there are 600 million people without reliable access to electricity, you are not going to create reliable baseload for national grids without natural gas. You are not, especially in countries like Nigeria. You cannot do baseload with solar in the same way. Like with, so if you have a knee-jerk reaction 
on ESG and then not think through some of these issues. And this is more of a SOCAP discussion. Um, and those, you know, me checking a box on my 401k, that means that like the asset allocation behind the scenes dramatically changes what's available for the space in which um, larger infrastructure projects investing takes place uh, in African markets. So I think it's incumbent to kind of have those real conversations and not have knee-jerk reactions to certain things that are more traditional or mainstream ESG, mainstream impact, because it may not have the impact that you think it will have in the markets that need the impact the most. I think that goes back to Saad's critical thinking um, yeah, idea. That's, exactly. that's great. Um, I think we have time for one question, and I saw one over here, so we'll go there. All right, thank you. My name is uh, Kwabna Boaten. And uh, listening to you all, I get the sense that there could also be a systemic problem uh, besides the evangelizing that you all advocating for. I've seen in the past the Minister of Finance of Ghana, for example, write an article about um, we are living in a post-Second um, World War economic architecture, and it doesn't inure to the benefit of Africa. Uh, just want your perspective on is that really true? Uh, is there a systemic issue uh, beyond, um, you know, the, some of the concerns that have been shared. There are zillion systemic issues. 3% hmm. of the world live in small landlocked countries. 33% of Africans do. Automatically making the cost of production and transport higher. Automatically making a lot of things uneconomic. Okay? And like... It's just a, a matter of like, those are systemic obstacles um, that we are trying to overcome, right? And there's efforts to get a larger market, you know, the integration, all of that. Um, you know, we are talking about countries like, you know, Nigeria, Egypt is bigger, but like many, many African countries are, you know, Sierra Leone is 4.5 million people, uh, Namibia is less than two. I mean, there's so many small, small countries um, as well. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't interesting opportunities because of the, the, the different uh, assets those, those markets have. But we are dealing with, if you're doing a cross-border project, then you have four, four political risk issues across the border. You might have different uh, currencies uh, you're dealing with. So, you know, it's 54 countries. It's systemically um, a product of all of those those challenges, and that doesn't even begin to talk about, let's say, the bias among rating agencies or whatever you want to dig into, um, or the structure of and everything from you know the, the the Bretton Woods institutions and who votes on them. That's that's just there's so many you can't even begin. But we at least need to make progress where we are, and that's um, what we're talking about, I think and bridging a, a gap from where there's a capital concentration, which is North America and the US, slowly, slowly in Asia, but this is compound interest, so why do we have capital uh, uh, co accumulation and concentration to where there's opportunity of the future? No, I think, I think we're, not, we're not here to try, to try and fight the systemic issues, as has already said. We're, I mean, we so, just, there is capital, there's capital, it, 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 in this asset class in other parts of the world, right? I mean, look at India, private credit, it's growing. Look at, you know, it's, it's big, right? We're just, asked, we're just saying, look, look at us. This is, this is real, this is happening. Um, and I th actually think before the pandemic, we were starting to see some early signs of European private credit investors looking into Africa because there was a big issue, there was lots of deals, there, there, there was short of deals, there was lots of covenant, covenant light lending going on in Europe, and we were thinking, this is the time. But actually what happened, the pandemic just created a lot of issues, lots of companies in Europe required restructuring, so people just kind of like, okay, let's just carry on doing what we're doing, focusing there. But, uh, but yeah, I think we're just saying, look, this, should, this, is, this is low risk, lower risk, this is good returns, this is impact, 
you can see all of this, you can count it, you can measure it, you can feel it, and there are lots of good stories that come out of it. And, um, and African banks make money. I mean, they make so much money. Look at that. Compare African banks' equity results uh, with, you know, European, Eastern Europe, other parts of emerging markets. They do, pr they do very well. You try and get a loan in, a, in an African bank, see what they price you at. No, there's a McKinsey study on African bank profitability. Anyone can access it. Check it out. Uh, and on systemic risk, I think I think that's a fair that's a fair question, right? So, so let's let's kind of quantify systemic risk. Uh, a container from China to Kenya costs forty dollars. A container from Kenya to Abidjan costs four thousand dollars. What's the underpinning problem there? The underpinning problem there is Kenya cannot transact with Abidjan in in any other currency but dollars. Now, the AFCA is trying to solve that, but these are the systemic risks that we're, we're, we're having to deal with in Africa. You don't have the same issues of, and, and by the way, one of the Chinese projects that is ongoing is this kind of single belt road initiative, right? And they want to basically just cut across the whole continent from the east to the west and really bring down uh, or create efficiencies across uh, those processes. Between Uganda to Tanzania, the railway system does not work. There is a railway line, but the system does not work. Yeah, no. And that's just going to neglect lack of capital. We're not even going there. We're not trying to solve those larger issues that are, that are kind of bubbling up that need to get resolved, right? The pipeline that had to be laid between Uganda to Tanzania to export oil out of Uganda was a $12 billion project that Russia wanted to do. And it's on, it's on kind of the back burner now. But all of these things, yes, it's not efficient. So the cost of exporting or, uh, or extracting oil out of Qatar is $11. The cost of extracting oil out of Ghana and Uganda is about 60, 70. So yes, those are all systemic issues. That's why in Nigeria, I think, is about 25 or something like that. So you need oil prices to be above that. As Abele kind of started with, there are a few commodities on which the, the governments rely. Copper is a big commodity for, for Zambia. When it goes up, Zambia does well. When it goes down, Zambia is not doing well. It's diversification of those economies that we're talking about. And that will come through industrialization. If you don't industrialize Africa, you have a problem on your hands with the demographic that is coming up, 18-year-olds 18, 18 not having access to jobs. That is going to become a systemic problem Global. that yeah. worldwide, exactly. You need to stop that, curb that issue right now by being, you know, smarter about how you take your capital and deploy it. The US wants to do more in, in Africa because they see this as a, as a boiling point, right? They see this as a, also a territorial war, right? But let's not go into politics. But they're, they're a little bit of both. Now, there is the positive aspect that we're seeing, but we're not seeing the capital cascading down. What we're, I guess, suggesting is, let's have that dialogue around private capital cascading down into industrialization, into creating value on the continent. That blueberry example, that mango example, they're perfect examples of creating value. We're looking at a, 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 an apparel manufacturer in Ghana that exports to the US. It, yeah, exactly. Um, and 80,000 women work there, right? It's a huge, huge infrastructure play. And it's bringing dollars into the country. Again, what's not to like? Nancy Pelosi was in that, in that uh, facility. I'm, again, apolitical, right? So I'm not saying what is good, what is bad, but I'm just saying that that has uh, brought in interest from the US. But capital flow is still very small, right? Um, so we're there to provide that capital, but we need larger pools of capital to access to be able to do that. I think that's great. Thank you all. I think the lesson here is we need to bring allocators to the table, but we also talked about how there are a number of different asset classes, a number of different ways you can invest in Africa, and why private credit is actually an excellent way to invest in Africa, especially right now.